Welcome to this week's version of Inside the Trojans Huddle, where we talk all things USC football and all kinds of things that are not. We have our usual panel today, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing them. You've already seen them before, probably. If not, I'll give you their names. You can Google them. Mark Hulkin, fan favorite, has his own podcast, writes all kinds of stuff for We Are SC. If you're not a premium member, sign up. And um, uh, and is a huge fan of the Breakfast Club, apparently, which may or may not come up. <laughs> Eric McKinney, the editor in chief of We Are SC, recruiting guru. It's a great time to be a recruiting guru because you have people asking you about the portal every eight minutes. We'll talk a little bit about that today. I'm your substitute host, Chris Arledge. Greg Katz is out, but uh, recovering, and he's paying attention to what's going on. So, behave yourself. Okay, fellas, are we uh, are we ready to get started? Let's do this. I promised some portal news. I don't know that I have any portal news, but we're going to bring it up. So, topic number one: a swing and a miss? Question mark. USC seems to be struggling in the portal at the most critical position, defensive tackle. How do you think USC's defensive staff adjusts? And how does this spring portal and the, so far, inability to land any sort of difference maker inside, how does that impact your view of the upcoming 2024 season? Uh, Eric, start us off. Uh, I will take the second part first. Uh, it it affects it negatively. It affects it negatively because Lincoln Riley was so kind of secure and forceful in his statement of this is this is the one spot. And he he did over the course of spring and leading into spring, he mentioned a few positions where you know we'll take a look here. We'd like to add here. We'd like to add here. But the one spot where he seemed to be kind of the the most adamant about we got to get a guy here was a defensive tackle. And he did add in there, you know, hey, everybody wants a defensive tackle. There's not a million of these guys. But with Derek Harmon, the Michigan State transfer, who ended up, spoiler alert, at Oregon, uh, he, he took a visit. He was at USC. USC was involved. Once you get to that point, if you're a school like, like USC, and I'm not saying you have to go – a million for a million or, or hit a hundred percent on every single transfer guy you bring in, especially when they are big name guys wanted by big NIL programs, you're going to get into battles there where, where you miss them. But that just seemed like one where it was, you got to go, you got, you got to go whatever it takes on this guy. Uh, and clearly USC for for a few guys and other programs for a few guys too. It got to a point where uh, we can't go there. We're, we're not going to go quite that far with what these other programs are offering. And so to miss on what seemed like your your top target at a spot where you said we got to go get again, not necessarily that he said we have to go get our top target, but wanted to add impact guys there. That that's a miss that sure feels like it sets up for now your roster is not as good as it could have been or or you thought maybe it could be. So where they pivot here, we've already seen those interior linemen, J.R. Suggs uh, from Grand Valley State, a defensive tackle, uh, Stephen F. Boston, defensive lineman, Brandon Lane. Those, those are a couple guys. And again, every program, right? This, this is not just USC saying, oh, let's see who else is out there. Maybe these guys. These guys are still being being targeted by other big programs, too. USC's not by themselves in going after these guys. So if you land those two, then you start, okay, the numbers seem okay there. We'll see where we can go. And then that softens the blow a, a little bit, a little bit. It's a different off-season conversation if you went out and landed – what was clearly your top interior target and maybe one or two other guys. So you're still, you still have a chance. You still have a chance to end this going, Hey, we added where we need to add. Now we coach them up. We've got, you know, size, we're ready to go. But no matter what, I think it'll feel a little more hollow than, than it could have. What do you think, Mark? Yeah, no, there's a big hole. No other way to put it. Uh, Eric was really eloquent with that, but look, um, 
they know what they have on their roster and they know what's arriving. And, you know, as Eric said, hopefully they're still going to get a couple of guys that are out there. But when you're throwing the, the perception out there that, hey, Derek Harmon's our top guy, we're putting all our eggs in this basket, we're going to go get him. And then at the 11 o'clock hour, you don't get him because Oregon swoops in and says, here's your check. That hurts. And you compound that because you're not going after guys, or at least you're telling the public that you're not going after guys who are actually from L.A., who could probably fit on this roster for whatever reason, whether you know their check was too big, you didn't want to overpay, whatever the case may be, you're missing out on guys that theoretically you should be you should be going after. They didn't. So we're told. So now what do you do? You know, Eric mentioned a couple of names. They took a visit. We'll see if that happens. But he also said that, you know, other big time programs have these needs to be filled as well. So in the end, you're probably be, you're going to be writing a bigger check than you wanted to for this for these guys. So where does that leave you? All right. Well, as I said, you know what's on your roster. You got a couple more guys coming in in the summer uh, that you recruited. Maybe it's time to make the adjustments internally on the offensive side of the ball. Slow the game down. Keep your own defense off the field. So if you're concerned about your run game being attacked, your run defense being attacked. You know, you could you can limit that by saying, hey, you know what? We're going to run the ball more on our side of the ball. I'm not talking about, you know, four yards and a cloud of dust, but look, you, you got to do something. Lincoln Riley said during the offseason that building the team going forward, the number one priority was defense first. Let's use his own words against him. Yeah, look, it's hard not to be disappointed at this point. Um I will say this. There are some USC fans on, you know, the We Are SC message board and other places who are upset that USC is going after these small uh, small school guys. Um, that, to me, doesn't make any sense. I don't know if, I don't know if it's Javier or Javier. I don't know how they pronounce it. Suggs from Grand Valley State. I don't know if he's, if he's an excellent player or not. But Oklahoma and Michigan and old Sear and and 38 other programs have offered the guy that gives me that gives me some reason to believe that he can play a little bit. I think he's a different type of player than that Harmon. Harmon was just a monster inside. Um, Suggs is not as big, but um, but look, it, there he's a Division two player. There were 43 Division two players on NFL rosters to start last season. That's more than Oklahoma and USC, and it's, uh, it's I think, a few more. Uh, it's just a few less than Ohio State and a few less than Georgia. So it's not like there aren't Division II players that can play. I don't know if this guy's one of them or not, but a lot of schools seem to think he is. So I don't know if it's a disaster if you land him and if you land the other guy from, uh, from a small school in Texas. Um, but look. It is a problem when USC cannot out recruit Oregon and is consistently getting beat by them. That's a problem. It's a problem. And, and it's, it's a, it's an historical anomaly because that's never been the case. Oregon has, as their program has gotten better and as their marketing has gotten more ubiquitous, they have done a pretty good job of stealing players out of Southern California, right? They've done that. But um, prior to the last couple of years, USC always had major advantages over Oregon as long as USC had their act together, which I think right now they do. If you look at their coaching staff, offensive and defensive side of the ball, you'd say, okay, that's a, that's a pretty good group of coaches. Um, and USC always had an advantage against the Oregons of the world when recruiting, when they didn't trot out Clay Helton or some clown like that. And that's just not the case anymore. And it's not the case because money is too big a part of uh, the equation. And while USC has made gains in the NIL front, it's pretty easy to see that they are nowhere near Oregon. And, and look, I don't blame transfer guys. Sometimes fans get upset. Oh, that guy only cares about the money. Well, I mean, how many of us choose our profession based on what we're going to get paid? I mean, some people may decide they're willing to take a 40% pay cut because they like another place better and more power to them. But most employees don't do that. Uh, and this is a business, college football. So I don't blame the guys for going to Oregon, even Oregon, which it's hard to stomach the thought of anybody willingly going there. I mean, I can understand if you were convicted of a serious crime and they told you either had to go to 
the federal pen or you had to go to Oregon choosing Oregon. I'd want to sleep on it, but I could understand it. It's strange seeing people actually make that decision, but increasingly that's going to happen. Now, what does that mean for, for, the, for the season? Uh, I think it means a couple of things. One is USC is going to have to play much more aggressively uh, in order to find a pass rush. They're not going to be – I don't think USC can rush forward and get to the quarterback. I think they're going to have to uh, – I think they're going to have to, uh, to blitz a lot more than maybe they want to. And I think they're going to have to run blitz and do some other creative things in order to find a way to stop the run, which is my much larger concern. Um, I think I think that Bear Alexander, Elijah Hughes, and the ends they have may very well be able to get to the quarterback reasonably well. Um, but you don't have you don't have big guys in the A gaps, and and so they're going to have to find a way to stop the run, and it's going to be difficult. And and that's not where you want to be. But I think that may be where they are. Unless, you know, unless they get a commitment from Suggs and, uh, and the, guy's, the guy's super quick and he's dominating the inside. I don't know. Uh, but, yeah, it's disappointing. And it, I don't think this is where Lincoln Riley expected to be. I mean, you go back and Mark said, let's uh, use his words against him. I, I, don't know, I don't know if we have to use him against him, but I'll remind people. This is a guy that said, yeah, you know what, I'm not really worried. When people leave, they leave. A hundred people will be there to replace him. Just turns out that it's not 100 guys that are 310 pounds. It's 100 guys that look like me. And um, and while I'm on my way to 310 pounds, I still have a ways to go. Uh, so anyway, look, it's it's disappointing. And and I suspect if Lincoln Riley were here and, and talking honestly with us, he'd tell us he's disappointed too, because I don't think this is what he expected or wanted. Um, we had a lot of dreams of, uh, and, and there were names being thrown about big name guys from big name programs that may be interested in jumping to USC. And that just hasn't happened. So yeah. we are where we are, fellas. Uh, yeah, any other thoughts to... on that? Go ahead, Mark. No, I was just, I didn't mean to characterize it as, you know, hold it against Lincoln Riley. You, you, you stated it the, the better way. Just look, Coach Riley, this is what you said. Let's use it to your advantage now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is what it is. Look, I, I don't think there's I don't think there's any reason for USC fans to uh, to throw in the towel on the season. This can still be a successful season if the secondary is better, if 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 they're better at linebacker, if the edge rushers are uh, are playing well, if Bear Alexander stays healthy, then then USC will be improved on defense. I think I think we know at this point that Lincoln Riley's offenses are likely to score a lot of points. And, and it's a schedule with a lot of big name teams. And as we talked about before, a lot of big name teams that probably aren't as good as they've been in the, in, in years past. So, you know, there are winnable games on this schedule. I don't think, you know, I don't think anybody expects USC to be 12 and 0, but can they get nine wins or even 10, especially if they get really stellar quarterback play? They can, but it'd be easier to do that. If you had a 330 pound guy in the middle, it's hard to block. Uh, okay. Enough of that. We'll whine about other things, but we're not going to whine about the portal anymore, especially when uh, we don't know what's going to happen. Okay, number two, maybe related to this. Um, USC has a history of putting teams on the field that did have good defensive lines, and I suspect we're going to see or hear some of them uh, on this question. Give me a final four of USC football teams for the ultimate USC playoff to find the uh, uh, USC's best. Give me your seeds and walk through what happens in the playoff. Okay, uh, Mark, give me your give me your four. Who are the top four USC teams of all time who are going to play in your playoff? All right, so number one seed, 2004 team. That's the team that destroyed Oklahoma, 55-19. It was a complete team. Offense, defense, Heisman winner, quarterback. That was one of the best teams I think USC has ever produced. Now, the number four seed that they have to play to get to the championship, it's going to be the 2003 team uh, that split the national championship with LSU that year. Number two seed, got the 1972 undefeated champ, uh, team versus the number three seed, the 1967 team that lost three to nothing up at Oregon State to the Heisman winner, Terry Baker. So, out of those four, uh, I think I have 
1972 beating 1967 to advance to the champ. Or do you want me to go this far or just give me Yeah, do it. Do it. You're on a roll. Let's do it. So 72 team beats 67 team. They were undefeated. That gives them the edge. I, r- let me remind people, this team had, they scored 39 points per game. They never trailed in the second half. They finished 12 and 0. They scored 467 points. Uh, at that time, it was the second most in school history. The defense intercepted 28 passes. They held their opponents to two and a half yards per rush. And they never gave up a run longer than 29 yards. That's a really good team. Um, so that's why they beat O.J. Simpson and the number one overall draft pick, Ron Yeri, um, that was uh, playing on the offensive line. 2003, I actually have that team beating the 2004 team. Because, number one, you had Mike Williams playing wide receiver. Number two, that 2003 team, they played some defense. That 2004 team, even though that was the height of the Pete Carroll dynasty, and they thoroughly destroyed Oklahoma, um, you could see that there was, I thought, at least for me, 2003 was a slightly better team. But again, that 2004 team, pretty good. I have 2003 upsetting them. And then uh, I'm going 1972 to win it all. 1972 to win it all. Mark pulls a Mark pulls an upset with the uh, with the Keith Jackson's pick for the greatest team of all time. Uh, oh, uh, All right, Eric, uh, improve upon that for us. I don't. I don't know if I'm going to do that. Uh, I. So when you do these exercises, right, the the recent teams would, I think, come out and just in terms of size and weight all over speed, kind of what they're doing offensively, these older teams would go, what's happening? Or what, like, what, who, who I'm supposed to block this guy or run through this guy? So you have to sort of transport them in terms of time and, and what they look like and all that. We do that. So. Uh, I did this backwards and far smarter people than me have always said that 72 team is the best USC team and probably maybe best college football team of all time. I stuck them at the top and worked backwards. So I like Mark, I have them at the top. My second team uh, is the, the 2004 team. So that's my final is 72, 2004. My three and four seeds who those two teams play in the first round they're different i i didn't have either of the team teams mark picked although the 67 team was in discussion there so my three seed that i have the 2004 two seed beating in the first round is the 79 team uh i didn't pick just from national championship teams that's one of those teams talked about as maybe a top five talented college football team of all time in terms of who was on there. Uh, And then my four seed that loses to the 72 team in the first round is the, the 1969 team took a while to get to defensive lines, but that wild bunch team uh, there is as my number four team. And who's winning it? So again, I stuck 72 in as the the winner before I even started seeding teams. Although again, you know, you're talking about that 2004 offensive firepower coming out and lining up against anybody from, you know, 50, 60 years ago and it'd be a surprise. 23 yeah. nothing at Auburn just gave just put it over the top for me. That was just such an impressive win. I'm sorry, Chris, go ahead. Yeah, no, it was a great win against an Auburn team that turned out to be pretty good. Um, I, I like all those. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw in, uh, I'm gonna throw in one team that wasn't mentioned that I think maybe makes the top four. And it seems strange because they didn't win a national title, but that 2008 team was just so extraordinary defensively, and um, they never would have lost again. They'd still be winning if they were together. They yeah. they still would not have lost if they were playing now. Yeah, look, I, I, I'll never know what happened in in Corvallis in the first half of that game. Uh, I've heard rumors. I'm not going to give any credence to them because I don't know whether it's true. 
but that was the best defense I've ever seen at USC and and it and and an offense that was that was pretty talented as well look up who they had on that roster and that's a really good football team I mean if if that 2008 team plays the 2002 three four or five teams I think they have at least a fighting chance to beat any of them they really do and so that was, uh, I think that team has to be mentioned. I, um, you know, I want to, uh, just because I love those teams, throw either the 88 or 89 teams in there, but they both lost a couple of games. That 1989 team should not have lost football games. They should not have lost. And I've, I've talked to a number of players on that team and, and they have the same sentiment. You just look at the defensive talent on that roster and it was extraordinary, extraordinary, just an unbelievable collection of defensive players. That's really a team that uh, that's that's sort of like an earlier version of the 2008 team in that uh, it's a team that had some offensive firepower, but really defensively, they were just loaded. But but at the same time, I saw them, I saw them get worn down in the second half against Notre Dame. So so they can't make the top four. I, I, I'm with. I'm with Eric. I think 1972 wins it, but it was a different era, right? If that team gets behind, they're screwed. Whereas if the 2004 or 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 2003, even 2002, I know they lost a couple of games. By the end of the season, that was a really good football team. If those teams get behind, they can come back. I just don't know how a team that that runs the ball 90 percent of the time and does not have a sophisticated passing attack can come back. But if you just compare them uh, to other teams in their era, there's a reason why, you know, there's a reason why Keith Jackson, the greatest college football announcer of all time said that's the best. So they probably win it, but, um, but that would be fun. And you're right. The 79 team, they had one tie, but geez, they had NFL hall of famers all over the place. Right. I mean, they had more NFL hall of famers than UCLA has had in their history. Probably. It's just a, a, a crazy roster. Uh, so that would be that that's a team you'd have to be, have to watch out for. Um, OK. Number three. What does USC need to do on the field to finish with a top five recruiting class? USC has some momentum right now when it comes to recruiting this high school class. Right. Uh, they have. They have an elite quarterback. They have a, a few different elite defensive linemen. Uh, they have a high ranking and a whole bunch of guys coming in over the next month or two that are big time prospects. You don't have to land all of them, but if you land your fair share of those guys, you're looking at a big time class. I think what everybody at USC is worried about is two things. One is, uh, is somebody going to come, come in and write a bigger check at the end of this thing? And we don't know the answer to that, but that's, that's, that's a legitimate concern. The other one is, will the will this hold if USC doesn't look good on the field? What do they have to look like? What do they have to do on the field in order to finish with that big time top five recruiting class that we're hoping for? Uh, Eric, what do you think? Well, on the field, are they going to do uh, House of Victory meetings with players on the field like that? I mean, that's a, that's a huge chunk of it, right? To no. to finish with a top five class, but I I understand where you're going that that's not part of this discussion so what they have to do what they have to do is not give up a ton of big plays like you cannot have all your highlights be your defensive backs trying to chase guys 70 yards downfield and just have gaping holes everywhere so that's a big part of it where you need everybody around these guys high school coaches and people who are who are talking to them through their recruiting being able to say yeah, that's good, sound, fundamental defense. I see what they're doing. That's a that's a big jump from what they've been doing. Now, I don't know how many of these Georgia high school coaches have been paying super, super close attention to USC's defense, but that's kind of the national narrative there. You cannot, you cannot get blown out by LSU or Michigan early. And I know that those are early and you can change the whole trajectory of your, your season, even if you do suffer big losses there you can still end up being pretty good by the end of the year but those would be things that would carry over all the way through as here we go again and those guys start looking somewhere else at you know you're talking early september their eyes are, are starting to wander there's not a ton of time to make that up by december 
So I think those are those are big. You have to come out strong. You have to show that you are again, it sounds stupid, right? But you have to show that you're improved. You have to show that like you want to play defense and defense is important to you. You have a, a few chances. LSU, Michigan, I think Penn State actually is a pretty big game because that's a that's a team that has a lot of attention from players back there. And it's out in L.A. And if, if you can make a statement, because those are, you know, Drew Eller, Nick Singleton, like those, those are some big name offensive guys. If you can shut that down, even though we've talked about kind of the Penn State offense, they've made some changes there. Uh, that would be, I think, potentially a, a statement game. But but that's really it. If you're talking about number, they need to finish with X number of, you know, yards allowed or in the top whatever of this. I don't think it's that. I think you need to show like this is this is not the same just leaky hole filled defense everywhere. I'll tell you what wouldn't hurt if you could get an edge guy to, you know, 10, 11 sacks or something like that, where somebody up front becomes, you know, hey, this this is a big name. In this defense, you can make this kind of impact, right? Laitu Latu for UCLA last year, he was a great player, but Danton Lynn was able to kind of hold on to him, right? The same way Eric Henderson and, and Aaron Donald sort of work. If you get a guy like that, that becomes a national name and everybody's talking about him that helps your entire system and and all the coaches there. So that would be, that would be a help too. I think even if you had one guy that, that took off past the rest of the defense. What do you think Mark? Yeah, not a whole lot to add. I mean, Chris, you kind of answered the, the question with your answer when you were introducing it. And I'm really efficient that way. Yes, you are. And Eric was very long and eloquent with his response. So I'm not going to add too much more, but look, it's kind of one of those no duh obvious answers. Win games, look like you're getting better weekly. Um, you mentioned at the top, write the check, make sure that you're securing these guys that you're you already have a top five recruiting class if it ended today. Well, you got to secure them, write the biggest check at the end of the day. And something that Eric touched on about you know having an edge guy, you know, you know, get you know, double do you know, double digit sacks. I'll take it a step further. Have one of the freshmen that came in this year, have him be one of those guys on the defensive side of the ball that makes an impact. I don't know if you have to have 10 and a half sacks, but just be part of the conversation every day where someone said, Hey, did you see Elijah Newby? Or did you see Cameron Fountain? Or did you see Carlon Jones? They made a play last week. And you're saying that every single week. So if you continue to do that, you'll look good against LSU, maybe even win against Michigan. Yeah. You're going to, you're, you're going to be able to save that top five recruiting class that you've got going. Yeah, I mean, right now, what what USC is selling is an elite, an elite defensive staff that can develop players. Right, that's what they're selling, um, and and so it'd be nice to have a proof proof of concept a little bit. I mean, one of the things I think you have to see is I think you have to see Bear Alexander take a big step forward. Um, it would help if Anthony Lucas took a big step forward. Um, those two guys are guys that um, that came in with a huge amount of talent. Bear played pretty well last year, but it was flashes. wasn't consistent. He didn't dominate football games. What you saw was every once in a while he'd do something really special, and you could tell he he could play. Anthony Lucas didn't do anything, and 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 so these are two guys that if if USC has a great staff of developers, these are guys that should play well. And I think it helps the story if what you're doing is saying, listen, um, you know, Bear and Anthony Lucas, we got, you know, Braylon and Ed, 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 or one of the other edge rushers, right? You, you want to be able to say, I took these guys from talented to highly productive and Bear Alexander's now a first round draft choice, right? I mean, that's, that's the story they want to be able to tell. Um, and we'll see whether they can tell it. I, I don't know. I don't know what to expect from Anthony Lucas. I think I know what to expect from Bear Alexander, assuming he stays healthy and he's sufficiently motivated. I don't know what it means that half the time in spring practice, he's walking out in uh, it, not in uniform. I don't know if that means he's not healthy. I don't know if it means he's not motivated. I don't know what it means. We don't, we don't have any information, but it's concerning 
because that is probably the most important defensive player on the roster. That guy has to dominate and he has to stay healthy. Those two things have to happen if USC is going to have a good defense. USC will be better defensively than last year. Of course they will be because, uh, shoot, just getting rid of Alex Grinch. Like if you didn't even replace him, if you just put him on a bus far, far away, the defense would probably be better. Um, with this coaching staff, of course, they're going to be better. You have a bunch of really experienced pros that are running things now, but you need those guys to play. Uh, you need some of those guys to show up to help the story they want to tell. Um, and uh, Eric mentioned uh, uh, not getting blown out. I think that's I think that's really important, especially in these big early games. The LSU game and the Michigan game are going to be watched by a whole lot of people. USC has to belong on the field with those teams. I don't know that they have to win. If USC loses a tight one in the big house, if they lose a tight one to LSU, but they look good doing it, you can you can bounce back from that. People will watch that and say, that was a great game between two really good teams. That's fine. You cannot get run over. You can't. You can't give up 40-something points. You can't lose a game 40 to 20. You cannot do it. Because if you do that, then all of this talk about how, the, about how the program is dedicated to defense, how we're turning the corner, how we have the staff we need, it may not be fair. That's the first game that, you know, the first or the third game that staff has been there. It may not be fair, but I'll tell you right now, every school in the country who's chasing after those big-time recruits will be telling you, I told you, Lincoln Riley teams never play defense. They never have. They're not right now. They don't, they're not an elite program. Do you want to play on a team that three games into the season has two blowouts and doesn't uh, and is no longer on, is no longer talked about on game day? They're no longer playing any big games. You can't do it. You have to play well in those games. You have to play well against Notre Dame. Everybody's going to watch the Notre Dame game. They're going to. You have to play well in those games. And there's no reason they can't. Look, those teams have their own issues. That's the other thing. It's not like you're playing at Georgia. You say, okay, if you, anybody going to Georgia is at risk of getting blown out. doesn't matter who you are. Ohio State playing at Georgia, they're going to have to play well not to get blown out. That's not the case. LSU at a neutral site with a new quarterback and a new defensive staff. Michigan with a new everything other than two defensive tackles. Those are games. Look, you can't spin those. You can't spin those. Those are games USC should compete in and they need to. So, We'll see. I mean, I, if USC finishes seven and five, it's going to be it's going to be a tough sell for some of these kids. If they finish nine and three, and and those three are are tough road losses to to teams like uh, uh, you know Michigan or or a tough loss to LSU, maybe a very close loss. To, I'm not even going to say that. Um, I was going to say I was going to talk about I was going to talk about another home loss that you might be able to deal with in PR terms, but I can't deal with it. So I'm not going to mention it. If they, if, if they play like that, that may be enough, assuming they can write big enough checks. Any, uh, anything to add on this topic guys. Okay. Let's move on to topic number four. Uh, I, I don't know whether big 10 fans have, uh, have discovered that we're out here yet. They may not discover us until the week before their teams play USC. But if they do discover us, we're going to upset some people right now. I want to start with give me a couple of overrated Big Ten teams this coming season and maybe a couple of underrated teams. Uh, Mark, start us off. Let's start okay. with let's start with overrated just so we can make people upset to 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 get us started. I'm sure we got a lot of fans up there in the Mitten State. I, I think Michigan, you, you mentioned it, Chris, they're going to be really overrated. The fact that they are a 12-point favorite over USC when, as you said, they're returning two defensive tackles. That's it. That's an overrated team. Uh, I'd start there. Say, yeah, I would definitely start there. I'll, I'm going to say it here, too. No, Oregon. I'm saying I'd start with the two defensive tackles. Oh, you can start with them, but you <laughs> I'd be, be, I'd be okay with that team. you got to score. <laughs> um, I'm going to throw Oregon in there. And, I, look, I know they're everybody's – the transfer portal's favorite team right now and the recruits favorite teams right now. But if you're not paying attention, they're one and two versus top 10 teams when they get in those big games. So I think Oregon might be overrated. And you, I, I think Chris, you mentioned Penn state and their lack of offense. I don't know. Maybe everyone will agree with you and me later, but drew Alar, he was just not a good quarterback. I don't care who you bring in as the offensive coordinator. It's not going to help. 
So those are the overrated teams. Yeah. Those um, are some good ones. Yeah. Eric, well, we'll we'll do we'll do underrated next. We're just gonna let people simmer in the negativity for a bit. Eric, uh give me some uh give me some overrated Big Ten teams. So Mark at the top, my overrated Big Ten teams, and I'm I'm looking at kind of last year's standard, and, and and maybe this isn't specifically for this fall, but just in general. Uh Maryland, Rutgers, Michigan State, Indiana, Iowa, Northwestern, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, Nebraska, Purdue. Right. The grind, the Big Ten schedule grind is overrated. All of those teams are Washington State or like semi down year Arizona states like that. I That is the thing that I'm sort of taking into the Big Ten. And USC is not going to beat every single one of those teams every single year. But the idea of like the meat of the Big Ten schedule producing this grinding chopping up of the Pac-12 teams coming over uh, is to me laughable. Th- those teams are those those teams are are not hurdles for USC and, and the rest of the Pac-12 teams coming over. Yeah. So again, there's probably some specifics in there for this one, but that I mean you you look at those teams and it's just there's there's not a team outside of if you get probably Michigan and Ohio State consistently on the road that you think, oh no, we gotta we gotta avoid this team this year. Yeah, that sounds right to me. If you take last year's Oregon State team and you put them on a neutral field against against those teams, I think the Beavers are gonna are gonna handle just about all of them. Um he, I'll give you a specific Iowa. Now, nobody thinks of Iowa as an elite program, but I was seen as a, as a, as a a really good program. They play great defense. Iowa plays great defense in part because they play a bunch of teams that can't play offense. Iowa fans, you guys are going to get lit up by the PAC 12 teams on your schedule. You're going to get lit up. You guys aren't that good defensively. Anybody can look, well, not Alex Grinch, but almost anybody can look good defensively against the teams that Eric named. They're lousy. I mean, they're offensively lousy. Um, And, you know, it'd be one thing if Iowa State is consistently holding Ohio State to 13 points, but they're not doing that. So I, I, I agree with all those picks. Look, Michigan is not a top 10 team this year. Michigan is not a team that should be favored by 12 over USC. I get that it's a home game, so give them three or four for that. Uh, you want to give them a couple of points because because they've been better uh, in recent years. That's fine, too. But 12 points for a team that loses everybody? I mean, they're replacing their entire offense. They're replacing their head coach. 13 drafted. 13 players yeah. drafted. And this, this is not this is not Alabama or Georgia or USC's Pete Carroll. It's not a team... That, is, that has recruited the, the number one or number two class for the last six years. So every time you lose a guy, what you're doing is bringing in another guy with first-round NFL talent. Michigan is a team that's re- that recruits pretty well. That's it. They don't recruit like Ohio State. They don't recruit like Georgia. They don't recruit like Alabama. They recruit pretty well, and they've done a really nice job of developing players. Do they have some guys that have been developed behind them to step up? Maybe. We'll see. But that does not look like a top 10 team to me, and it does not look like a team that should, that should be favored by 12 over USC, even though USC has their own question marks. Um, Oregon also, I mean, I've seen Oregon as high as number three preseason. Come on. What are you talking about? Oregon, Oregon is a team that is coached by, coached by an impulsive child who's a fantastic recruiter. But his game day decisions are what I expect from a 12-year-old playing, playing Madden at home on his television. And, uh, and I don't know that when you pick up an experienced and good quarterback who wasn't good enough to start at the other program he was at, so he had to get in the transfer portal, I don't know if that guy replaces Bo Nix. Bo Nix, for all the trash I talked when he first went over to Oregon, because I thought the guy was garbage at Auburn. He was garbage at Auburn. The guy's a good football player. He ran around and made plays consistently, right? I don't know. I don't know that they're better at quarterback this year. I suspect they're not. Um, and Dan Landing will throw away two games doing something stupid in the fourth quarter. That's what he does. He's great at it. Great recruiter, and he's great at that. 
great at getting new tattoos and putting them on Instagram or something. I don't know. They, oh, I can't stand that team. And I understand right now I'm being biased and I'm just letting the hate flow. I can't stand it. It drives me nuts that Oregon is getting the press they're getting. It drives me nuts that players go to Oregon because they get a big check and then talk about how they're going to Oregon because they want to be developed. That's silly. So no, they're, paying, they're paying for their advertising. That's what you just you said. Go to, go to Alabama or Saban if you want to be developed. Go to Georgia if you want to be developed. We can go to Oregon so you can be developed. This is just silliness. All right, listen. We've, 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 we've wallowed in the negativity too much, and that's my fault because that's the sort of thing that I do. Are there underrated Big Ten teams? this coming season who do you got start us off mark you got any underrated big 10 teams yeah i got two um homer alert usc uh <laughs> yep. and i'm gonna i'm gonna throw sparty into the mix i'm gonna give michigan state an underrated label because i think jonathan smith is a damn good coach i think we all agree that you know what when usc was doing their head coaching search jonathan jonathan smith's name was at the top of the list or near the top of the list. So why not throw Michigan State in there, right? Jonathan Smith is a fantastic coach. I don't know what I don't know if he has the talent that he needs to I don't to, think he has a single offensive or defensive lineman coming back. Every time you you see somebody in the portal, it's a Michigan State and lineman. They'll still win nine, and they'll still win nine games this year. Watch. They might. I mean, look, that that's a when you when you see all these Michigan State guys uh jumping into the jump into the portal that that tells me without knowing anything else that michigan state must have the worst nil program in the country because if if you're if you know anything about football you should look at jonathan smith and say okay this is this is a guy i want to play for right i mean if usc if you if lincoln riley took took the cowboys job next year and usc hired jonathan smith there would be very few usc fans that would be anything other than excited about that prospect right that guy is a damn good football coach um, so I don't know if Michigan State's going to be good this year, but in three years, I bet they will be. Uh, okay, Eric, what do you got? Underrated Big Ten teams. So, I, you know, you know, I hate to agree with Mark. You know, I do. Uh, yeah. it's, usually, but it's usually embarrassing to see. I, I mean, that's that's really it. Seeing, uh, Seeing USC like the win total at like seven, seven and a half, that that seven. feels that feels low. And then I saw Joel Klatt released his top twenty five now, and he's got USC at fifteen, and it's like, oh, that feels high. Like maybe maybe we need to find some kind of consensus there because fifteen at this point uh, with this off season is is interesting. Um, I there is. No talk about Washington, it feels like, this offseason. And again, that's like Michigan. Lost an absolute ton. New head coach. Like, I I thought when Jed Fish got to Arizona, that was kind of a joke. And he was just sort of a name that you'd heard a lot. But my goodness, he, he did great stuff in not that long at Arizona, Washington maybe has some of that sort of, and it, and it's why not to, not to change tracks here, but it's why I don't think I'm as down on, on Michigan as you guys. It feels like that Harbaugh blood got into that program. And if you set that and kind of keep going, maybe you can do that. So like, it's the, the DeBoer feel, maybe if that's still at Washington and Jed Fist just has to kind of pick that up and keep going with it, could be an interesting program again. If I, I, haven't, I haven't had time, right? Nobody's had time to look at all the ins and outs of the transfer portal at every single program. But Washington kept enough of those guys that played a bit and felt that run last year. Maybe that's an interesting team uh, that comes in here. They, they play... They play Oregon. I think they've got Michigan. I think they've. I'm, I'm doing this off the top of my head. I think they miss Ohio State. I don't think. I don't think their schedule is one of those ones where it's like, oh, we play everybody in the conference this year. So, again, just in terms of like somewhat a, a program that is getting not a lot of talk this off season, that that one could be, could be a, a pretty good program. Yeah, I'm not going to agree with Mark, but I am going to give the same answer that Mark gave. Um, I'm going to I'm going to hold to that distinction. Uh, look, I think 
here's the thing. USC has USC has some holes, and USC fans know those holes better than better than most. Um, but USC fans also want to pay in, paying attention to the holes that every other team in the country has because they almost all have them. Um, Lincoln Riley's worst offense scored about 38, 39 points a game. Um, USC is going to score a bunch of points. They are. They have, I think they're going to be fine up front. Uh, I think they're going to be pretty good at quarterback. And I think they have skill position guys that can really run and make plays. And, and they're going to score a lot of points. And if you score 40 points a game, you don't have to play defense that well to get to nine wins. You really don't, right? I mean, you can't play like you did the last two years. USC's not going to play defense like they did the last two years. They're not. Uh, they're, they're not going to consistently put themselves in cover zero with no deep help and get no pressure off the court. I mean, they're not going to do that stuff. That, that's ridiculous. They're not going to do that stuff. They're going to keep contained. This USC defense is going to – I mean, I don't know if they'll keep contained every play the entire season, but – but that's the sort of thing they're going to be able to do fairly consistently. The defense is going to be better. And if the defense has given up 25, 26 points and you're scoring 40, you're probably going to win nine games. I think USC is also underrated. I, I, I don't know if they're number 15, but if they finish number 15, I wouldn't be shocked. I think that I think they're a team that can do that. Um, I'll throw another one out. I think Wisconsin might be, I think Wisconsin might be decent this year. I, they have a culture that I think Luke Fickle is able to embrace and further. It's a program that plays good defense. They run the ball. Um, uh, they often do it with, with players who weren't highly recruited. I could see Wisconsin being the sort of team that could cause, that could cause some problems, maybe even at the Coliseum. I mean, if you, if you want to talk about the sort of team that you don't want USC playing against, it's a team that just badly wants to run the ball between tackles. Um, so I think, I think that's a team that might, that might, uh, that you, might play pretty well. You know, that, you know, Alex green has got a co co-coordinator title. This oh, they're gonna, yeah, they're... yeah. Well, here's, here's what I'm assuming. I'm assuming that he's not going to be calling the defense and that his only job is coaching the safeties and he'll probably screw those guys up. But the other, the other nine, I think will play well, but you're right. I mean, Alex Grinch being there is a, is a problem for my argument. Who do you think is um, going to be the most disappointing team out of the big conference this year? Because I have an answer for that one. I'm curious to hear your answer. Um, I'll tell you who it's not going to be. It's not going to be Ohio State because Ohio. Well, State they've got to win the whole thing, or else they're well, they're I'm the most true. disappointing team, right? I, I mean, don't, I don't look. I don't know if that's true. If Ohio State makes the playoff and loses a and loses a close game to somebody, I I think most people will look at that as as as. Ohio State fans would be upset, but most but most observers will say, okay, that's a good season. And I think they are going to to do that because Ohio State is loaded with talent and they play the easiest schedule in the conference. It's hard to see Ohio State losing more than one game this year. Uh, but they can lose two. Their schedule sets up great. You're absolutely correct. Yeah. But their quarterback situation, I think, is a little bit more dire than people want to believe. Um they're not happy with the whole Will Howard thing. They actually might be starting a true freshman this year. Well, we'll see. They have they certainly have a bunch of guys who are supposed to be elite talents at that position on their roster. And he's going to have people to throw to that can run. We'll see. I think Ohio State's probably going to be fine. I don't I don't know that they're going to win at all, but that's a team that that's a team that that you just look at their schedule and almost every week you say, that's a win, that's a win, that's a win. So they're going to make the playoff. I mean, if they lost, I guess if they lost in the first round of, of the playoff to a team that's much lower ranked, that would make for a disappointing season. It's just, it's just hard to imagine them not winning eleven games. I don't know. I think Penn Penn State has a chance, right? Like they they were just locked in at number three every year in the Big Ten. Like there was Michigan, Ohio State. They did their best to to beat those teams, but if they didn't, those would be a couple losses. Then they just beat everyone else, and you're comfortable at three. If some of these Pac-12 teams come in, you know, if, if Oregon, if USC, if some of these programs slide in above them and they get bumped down five or six, that that's a that's a significant change and a hindrance to them recruiting well and and being kind of that Big Ten power. I, th I think that program maybe was like the least excited about some of these new new teams coming in. I think that's right, and I think. 
I was a big I was a big Franklin fan at Vanderbilt because it was hard to imagine anybody winning seven or eight games a year at Vanderbilt consistently, right? And he did, I think, three t- three times in a row. Um, but I don't know if you're going to put together a list of the top five coaches in the country. Does anybody have him on that list? I don't think so. I think if you're putting together a list of the five most overrated coaches in the country, I think a lot of people would have him on that list. Um, and, and Lincoln Riley may also be on that list until he plays some defense this year. But, uh, but I think Franklin is a guy who has a program that, uh, that has a lot of NFL talent and doesn't seem to do a lot with it. And they struggle every time they play a big game. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe that's just because I, you know, it's not like I watch every Penn state game, but, you follow college football enough, and that's what it kind of looks like. It's a team that consistently comes up short, no matter how much talent they have. And um, and, and I'm not sure that's going to change either. So I think you're right. They could they could go from being the third best team in the Big Ten to being fourth, fifth, sixth best team in the Big Ten if they're not careful. Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen this year, but it might. And they're going to and 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 look, they they have to uh, come to the Coliseum. And that is not necessarily an easy, an easy game for them. I know USC fans look at it and say, well, we're terrible. We have no defensive tackles. Okay. But, uh, but Penn state is going to have to find a way to score 37 points to win that game. Probably. We'll see. Uh, All right. Any other thoughts on overrated, underrated big 10? Okay. You know what time it is, fellas. It's time it's time to compete head to head for all the glory that uh, that a YouTube program that goes to a handful of thousands of people a week can uh, can muster. That's what this is about. Um, all right. We got 10 questions. We're starting zero to zero. The questions usually are worth one point. They're not always worth one point. And uh, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be the sole determiner both of how many points a question is worth. Uh, and and who wins the point and whether points should be deducted as usual. We good with that? Just shake your head yes, because if you don't, you're going to lose a point. And if you do shake your head yes, now I have you, albeit under duress, agreeing to my rules so you can't complain. All right, question number one. What numbers, if any, should be retired by USC? Mark Holkins, start us off. None of them. It, look, it, if the retired jerseys that are actually retired right now, aren't actually retired. Why should we throw number 55 on the bench all of a sudden or put number one on the bench? It makes no sense. I mean, since the Heisman jerseys are the only jerseys that are retired by USC, Mike Garrett's number has come out of retirement. Carson Palmer's number has come out of retirement. I have no doubt that Caleb Williams number is going to come out of retirement. I mean, it's going to be worn this year by Mason Cobb. So the answer is none. Okay, solid answer. Eric McKinney, which numbers, if any, should be retired? Yeah, the the Heisman numbers should be displayed right up in up in the peristyle. But I have I have no problem playing with them. So maybe you maybe you retire them for a year or two after they win. And and I'm talking about going forward here, like nobody wears it the next year or two years after that. But then I think you use it as a as and we've talked about right as a recruiting inducement or as a reward for someone who, you know, as a sophomore has a big year and then can wear them later. I don't, some of these guys get attached to their numbers and that's what they want to wear. But no, I think you, as long as you're not giving them to, I think like there was a, there was a 40, 42 was like on a walk on safety or long snapper or something for years. Like you can't, you cannot do that. There's numbers where you cannot do that. They've got to be worn by guys who are contributing and playing. But yeah, you you put them back in. I like what LSU does. I like LSU's got, I think, seven and 18 or something that go every year they're worn by specific guys that either at a position or meet like a, a certain criteria, but that's it. But I'd love some of these, some of these USC running back Heisman winning numbers in rotation and, and still playing. I think that's fine. Look, Lamar Dawson wearing 55 did not destroy the 55 number at USC. You don't want two decades of that, but to see it on the field at USC, you should have more guys deserving of those numbers than not. And those are fun numbers to see out there. 
I want to yeah. see the first brave Trojan to put number 32 back on their shoulders. That would be interesting. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You mentioned you mentioned the the first brave Trojan because there are there are numbers at USC that seem to be practically speaking retired, even though they're not retired. People are not wearing 55. People are not wearing five. And 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 so from my perspective, I wouldn't retire any numbers. I would uh, I would have, you know, at some proteins, like the Cowboys have this ring of honor, right? Where you recognize particular, particular guys without retiring their numbers. Um, that's probably what I would do. But if you were going to retire numbers, I would not retire every Heisman number. I don't think it makes sense. I don't think that as great as Charles White was, and he was amazing, I don't know that number 12 is the sort of number that people would hesitate to put on because of, because of Charles White. I feel the same way about Leinert's 11. Matt Leinert was a fantastic quarterback, had one of the greatest resumes of any quarterback ever. I just don't think people would put, I don't think, I don't think people would say, oh, I'm not going to wear 11. Leinert wore that. Number five, you can make an argument for retiring. Either USC doesn't want people to wear it or people don't want to wear it. That's a retired number that's not retired, and there's a reason for that. 55 is the same way. If you're going to retire a number, 55 should be retired. Um, 42 has received bad treatment. 42 is a number. 42 is a number that with 50, if I had to pick two, I'd retire 55 and 42 just because, just because Ron, uh, Ronnie Lott stands at the apex of football in a way that I'm not sure any I'm not sure any other USC player does. Marcus Allen is Marcus Allen was a Heisman winner, college Hall of Famer, NFL Hall of Famer, Super Bowl MVP, incredible. Marcus Allen was not the best player at his position to ever play football. Ronnie Lott was. I I would retire Ronnie Lott's number if you're going to retire any. So I think if you're going to retire any, I would I would retire 55. I'd retire 42. And if if nobody wants to to take number five on and and carry that weight around, I guess you retire that one too. You might as well retire it if nobody's going to wear it. But I'd stick it on Zachariah Branch. Anyway, um, five oh, five yeah. to me is funny. Sorry to not yeah. to jump in, but five to me is funny because USC had to right disassociate with Reggie Bush and couldn't give out number five. I, I would say every single player in college football who has worn number five over the last 15 years has specifically done so because of Reggie Bush. And most of them say it, which is why it's so funny to me that USC had to just run, sprint away from him. But he was helping, you know, all these all these other programs and these players wear number five and say, oh, it's specifically because of that guy. Well, the weirdest thing about it is USC had to disassociate from Reggie, which means they couldn't retire number five, which means right, they could have been giving number five to people, but sure. they didn't, but they didn't because everybody understood that, well, if, if Heisman winners need to be retired, five should be retired. So nobody's going to wear it. But um, in any event, I like both answers. I, I hate what USC does with retired jerseys. It's silly to me to retire every single Heisman uh, number and it's even sillier to me to retire 11 and 12 and now 13, but not 55 and not 42. That's just dumb. It's just dumb. So I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't put up with that anymore. Good answers both. We're tied at one. Question number two, a ridiculous question. And I actually changed it since you guys saw it, so you don't know what's coming. Oh. But here's the, well, it's still going to be, look, it's still going to be similar to to, uh, to help recruiting and fundraising, I propose that Taylor Swift needs to start attending games at the Coliseum. You saw what that did for the Chiefs. You saw what it did for the NFL. My question is, how do we make that happen? With Caleb Williams gone, I don't know that there's any current Trojan that we can propose should date her. I don't know if anybody has that level of gravitas. So how do we make that happen, guys? How are we getting Taylor Swift to show up so that every girl between 13 and woman uh, under the age of 37 now wants to watch every single USC game every week. What do we do? Uh, Mark, start us off. So we're not talking about helping recruiting anymore, correct? Uh, well, yeah, it's going to help recruit. It's going to help right. recruiting. We're going to have all kinds of money flowing in. Right. You know what? Can we? I would like to make a trade. No more. We don't need Taylor Swift to do it. Okay. Bring in Katie Perry. She's the girl for college football. 
You remember when she was on college football game day? She did that call me thing with Trevor Knight. That's going to help with recruiting. If USC has some good looking player out there, have Katy Perry say, hey, call me. That's going to help. Okay. Okay. Katy Perry, he says. I don't I, think he, I don't, I don't think Mark, I don't I don't think Mark has any idea what the what the relative what the relative star status is of all uh, I know is that when people are watching Chiefs games, half of the people are saying, Oh, look, they're showing Taylor Swift again. It, she was getting on people's nerves. It's true. It's true. Okay. That's one of her specialties. But she also in but we it would be a sellout. Most of the people at the stadium in all those empty seats, they'd be 17-year-old girls. But still, 17-year-old girls are going to bring some money. They're going to contribute to – you just tell them. You just tell them you can sit in the same side of the stadium as Taylor Swift if you contribute $800 to House of Victory and just watch what we do. Yeah, this this just feels a little bit like something Oregon would do, and I just can't get on board with this. I'm yeah, sorry. That's fair. That's fair. I, saw, I said it was a dumb question before I asked it. I'm I asking just... it to you anyway, McKinney. Go ahead. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's a concert. Right? So Taylor Swift, like Swift speed, like Zachariah branch, I think would be the, the pair just in terms of what, what the name means. Right. If you could get them together. Uh, but I, I think it's a comp, right. A pair style and concert out there helps with like tailgating and all of that, where you bring that in and then you go, I, the USC, right. You can't get into uniforms. The era's costumes were so out there. And, and I don't even want to bring up like using that to go alternate uniforms. Cause that's not going to happen at USC. Although Mark, I think the Oregon connection could do something there. That would be interesting if, if they started to do that. But I think ultimately that's it. I, th I think the pregame concert. And then what I will say is her decision. And you see Netflix do this with standups too, where, you say, we're going to charge for everyone to be here at this event. Then we're going to charge you again to watch video of the event afterward. If her company that put together that the, the movie, right, of her tour did that, and this goes back to all those USC fans that love those kind of hard, I'm, I'm even blanking on the name of it right now, where they would go week by week and put together like the behind the scenes look at, at the USC games that sort of hard knock style thing that would be, I think, I think that's two birds with one stone right there where you still get kind of those hardcore USC fans that would absolutely turn in, tune in to that kind of production week to week. All right. So this is what I'm going to do. I, I was going to give the point to Eric because Mark foolishly thought that Katy Perry is at the same level of stardom as Taylor Swift and I, even as a 50-year-old guy who doesn't listen to either one of them, I know that's not true. At the same time, he pointed out that there is a certain Oregon ick factor to what I'm suggesting we should do. And because of that, nobody gets a point, but I lose one. Okay, still one-to-one -one going into question three. Question three is an important question. Who is Manti Teo currently dating, and should she be a guest on this show? McKinney, start us off. So it turns out Manti Teo is married, has been married for, for years and years. So I'm going to go, I'm not going to do the Manti Teo connection, but the Manti Teo connection to who we should get on this show is the cast of this new movie, If, right? Invisible Friends. So we're talking Ryan Reynolds, John Krasinski, Steve Carroll, Louis Gossett Jr., Emily Blunt, Matt Damon, Maya Rudolph, John Stewart. Like this, this gets us through the off season. If we can get the imaginary friends cast on here, and that's our tie into Manti Teo. And I would be stunned if we couldn't get all of those people onto this show. I mean, I'm sure they're all listeners. Uh, Emily Blunt, uh, after this week's episode, just give me a call. We'll get you scheduled for uh, for next week's show. Uh, Mark Hawkins, what do you think? Apparently, Manti Teo is married. I don't know if it's, I'm assuming, to a real woman. Uh, what do you think, though? News, well, yeah, news to me. So let's... Let's talk about his imaginary side chick. You know, um, I think it's the girl up there in Canada, kind of like uh, Brian's girlfriend from Breakfast Club. You can never confirm she really exists. So he could say, yeah, I'm going to invite, we can invite her on the show. She just never shows up. Yeah, didn't Napoleon Dynamite also have a uh, have a girlfriend who lived in, 
I can't remember if it was Canada, but somewhere far Niagara away. Niagara Falls, Niagara Falls, right? <laughs> I think so. Uh, okay, I like both answers. It's two to two. And we move on to number four. We're actually going to talk about football again, surprisingly. Uh, what should Lincoln Riley's game plan be against LSU? How, how are we going to beat the Bayou Bengals? How's it going to happen? Uh, start us off, Mark Culkin. Establish the run game. Just pretend you've been in the Big Ten for 30 years. This is all you know. Run the ball, run the ball, play action, go over the top. By the time you get into the second half, have the LSU defenders gassed. So Mark Hogan says we're pounding the rock. Eric McKinney, what do you think? What's the game plan to beat LSU? So I think the the ultimate goal is like that, but you can do it a couple different ways. You can ball control offense by throwing it and rolling out and, and doing things like that. I don't think I don't think you need to be so stubborn to say we have to run, we have to run, we have to run. What I will say is every good LSU defender coming back. I, I guess I don't mean every good. All of their marquee names coming back are edge guys. And uh, if if you've got that on the edge, your first game, you just you, – you cannot ask your tackles, right? If they're going to use Harold Perkins on the edge to go after the quarterback, you cannot tell whoever it is to just say – you know, if, if it's Elijah Page on one side, Mason Murphy on one side, hey, block that guy. Block 40 for 55 snaps this game one-on-one -on -one in pass rush can't do it so if you want to run run at him right I, I i'm with mark on that if you want to wear one guy out wear that guy out and he may not be human to the point where he can go the whole game like that but you got to test him uh they've got a couple edge like edge rushers to outside of him so again if you can push up the middle if you can keep things protected on the outside, I think that's going to be big. And then Miller Moss is going to be, don't play like Caleb Williams. And and I don't mean, you know, don't put up big numbers, don't do whatever. But it maybe more than anything else Lincoln Riley said during spring was when he kind of made this side comment to the quarterback position is going to be played differently next year. And that could mean a lot of different things. I mean, obviously, Miller Moss is not Caleb Williams. But if that's a push to like, no, 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 we want a far more structured pocket. We want the ball out on time. We don't want him to have to pull it and run and do all this stuff. Then that becomes more of what Mark's saying, that ball control offense without having to just run the ball 45 times into a brick wall if that's not where your strength is. So I think that's it. I'm, I'm with Mark on ball control, but at, absolutely you have got to find ways tight ends, running backs, whatever it is, to help on the edge where you're not asking a young offensive lineman to take on those edge guys for LSU. How many points do we need to score to win that game? I don't think we're, I don't think USC wins that game scoring 24. Do you? I mean, that no. that, that that feels like a game where they, they're going to have to score 35-plus to have a chance to win, right? I, I so, think 25 and 40 is the number. I mean, it, it would be one thing if I felt comfortable USC could run the football, have eight-minute drives, and 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 shorten the game. I wouldn't be opposed to that, but I don't think they're going to have that kind of offensive line. I think they're going to have a, I think they're going to have a a passable offensive line if if Lincoln Riley um, mixes things up. And I think where they're going to have their biggest edge is is in that uh, in that wideout group. And LSU is going to have some talented guys in the secondary. They always do. Um, but as, as Lincoln Riley put it, with, with those four guys, you sort of have an advantage every single week. Um, so I think you're going to have to run a lot of misdirection. I think you're going to have to – your running backs are going to have to block. Some, you're going to have to play a tight end more than you want to maybe and, and see, if you can, see if you can chip that, uh, that, that, that star edge rusher. Um, but I, I think you're going to have to, you're going to have to throw the ball. You're going to have to throw it quick. You're going to have to throw crossing routes. You're going to have to do a lot of misdirection and you're going to have to mix it up. Ultimately, you're going to have to have to run the ball at least a little bit because you can't be one dimensional because that opens up the RPO game. But I just, it's hard to imagine USC just imposing their will offensively against LSU with the offensive line. And it's it's virtually impossible for me to imagine USC beating LSU twenty four to eighteen. I just don't think it. I don't think it's going to be that kind of game. 
it, even if you have a really good defense, if you're playing against teams that have talent, you're going to give up points these days. And, and so uh, in, in the very first game of this defensive staff in, in on a team that is questionable in the middle up front, I think you're going to have to score 35, 38. If you're going to have to score 35 to 38, you better get your ball in the hands of Jacoby Lane and Zachariah Branch and Makai Lemon, and 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 you better do it consistently. Well, I think I think Branch can't just be a regular receiver for you, right? He can't just run routes and catch maybe four balls. Like you've got, he's got to have some design plays where, it, like you're saying, misdirection. If he takes something out of the backfield, end around stuff like that. But you've got to figure out. 10 to 12 sort of manufactured touches for him, I think at minimum in a game like that. One of the disappointing things last year offensively is that USC did not do that with Zachariah Branch very often. Every once in a while, they'd find a way to get in the ball creatively. They didn't make a strong effort to do that. And you have to, because, um, because if you move him around, if you find different ways to get the ball in his hands, then one, you give him a chance to break something. And every time he touches the ball, he has a chance to break something. And two, you force the defense to think, right? When, when Zachariah Branch lines up somewhere unusual, when he goes in, when he goes in motion and you think it's going to be a, uh, 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 you think it's going to be a, a jet sweep, or if it looks like he's, uh, if you fake the reverse to him on an outside running play, these sorts of things slow down the defense. They make the defense think. And, and, if you have a talent like that, and I can guarantee LSU's defensive coordinator is going to be talking every single practice and every single meeting about, we have to know where he is. So put him places that force them to think and slow and slow him down. I don't think Lincoln Riley did a good job uh, of doing that last year at all. And I was actually quite surprised that he didn't. Uh, Branch is now a sophomore uh, he's had more time to understand the offense. If Lincoln Riley's not doing that this year, I'll be stumped. And, and I think you need to start with that right away. Uh, and then, and then see if you can see if you can throw the ball, uh, in, in the end zone, high, uh, back shoulder throws to, to your very tall, very long arm outside receivers, Lane and, and Robinson, because those guys are a matchup problem for just about any corner. Uh, so take advantage of it. Yeah, Mark, was, you're going to say something. Yeah, you know, I didn't want to give off the impression of, you know, ground and pound, three yards in a cloud of dust, but... That's you know, what you did, Schimbeckler. That's what you did. <laughs> but play action does the exact same thing that you guys are talking about, about having the defense just have to hold for that extra split second, especially those F, those edge guys. You slow those guys down, you're now opening up your running game, and that is going to open up your passing game, especially big plays down the field, with Zachariah Branch or with your tall receivers that you were just mentioning. So just a little bit more pro set type of stuff. It doesn't have to be that air raid stuff that Lincoln Riley is so comfortable with. Okay. Eric McKinney gets the point because Mark Culpkin wants to run the fullback 37 times up the middle against LSU. And I just don't think that will work. Question number five, dinner party at your place. You can invite three Trojan football players, living or dead. They'll come alive, by the way, um, if you invite them. So who do you invite? Mark, redeem yourself. Who do you bring? I thought you guys took my answer from the last one, but okay. Um, I got Troy Palomalu. Okay. Actually, no, check that off. I've got Ronnie Lott. You just disinvited Troy? Mark just disinvited Troy Palomalu. He's oh, showing up anyway, buddy. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. RSVP list. I've got Ronnie Lott. I've got Lendale White. And if I've got to have somebody keep Troy out, I've got Brian Cushing. So I've got Psycho on my side. I'm good I with those. I believe that you just invited him, but you just invited Brian Cushing to physically restrain him. Okay, <laughs> Eric McKinney, give us an answer that isn't going to upset everybody, including me, because that would Mark, be... I didn't Mark's like hosting a dinner party slash fight club. Phenomenal. <laughs> uh, all right, so so I've got Charles White, who I was always told was this the coolest guy on campus. Uh, I've got Pete Adams coming because finding a stray dog and naming him turd is there, there's no way that's the funniest thing he's ever done. So he's going to have stories. Uh, and then I've got Sean Cody as a guy who, again, ta to be able to talk about kind of the building of USC and that he's been around a lot lately. And so getting his kind of unfiltered thoughts right on what USC football 
has been over the last, let's say, decade and and going forward. Uh, I think I think he'd be an interesting guy to have there, too. Also, I forgot to do this because I had the other line on Mark, but I know how you like when we reframe the questions and ask follow ups and whatever. It was yeah. going to be different if I have to cook or not. Right. If I have to cook, then I'm inviting Taj Washington and I'm putting all that on him and you using one of my my spots for him. But I took it as I, I don't have to cook the food. So th those are my three. So you were going to put Taj Washington to work is what you were going to do. Um, I okay, feel like well, he enjoys it, right? That's an enjoyable part of his life that he gets to do. I don't know. But if somebody told me, hey, Chris, you can come to a dinner party, which, by the way, nobody ever does. But if somebody did that and then said, but I expect you to cook all the food, I don't know that I'd feel good about it. You insulted Taj Washington. Mark insulted Troy Polamalu. But when it comes to when it comes to USC football, insulting Troy Polamalu is worse. So Mark loses a point. Eric gains a point. So it's Ronnie Lott isn't. So Ronnie Lott wasn't insulted by keeping him off the dinner list. Is what you're saying? You could. You had three spots. I, I assumed Ronnie Lott was going to make the list. It, Ronnie Lott should be there no matter what. I, I put would, him on the I list. Would, I would like to bring John Wayne to the to the dinner. He probably doesn't have a lot of knowledge about, about recent USC football, and he'd probably be very angry when he hears about it. But not only do you have a legendary figure uh, at, your, at your dinner party, but you have a guy that is based in another – he has that, that old guy, I'm going to say whatever I want to say, no filter thing going the whole night. It'll be hilarious for everybody else who's there. Uh, okay, fine. The score is 4-1. to one. Um Oh, wait, you're bringing in no filter guy. I bring in Lindell White. What's the difference? Uh, no, th those are both no filter guys. I agree with that. Mark, well, Chris is going to have to invent new negative numbers to get to your score. At this point, I, don't, I don't know I'm where you're going. Playing, <laughs> at this point, I'm just playing the game. No, you're not. That's the problem. You're not playing the game. You insulted Troy Polamalu, and then try to get and then try to get somebody else to manhandle him, which is ridiculous. Okay, listen. Sure. Question number six. Mark, just stop. I don't want to have to keep taking points away. Every time I have to, every time I take points away from you, people complain. You know this, right? I, I almost feel like you're trying to cause this to happen, just so you can, just so you can have people come to your defense. I've never been called manipulative in my life once. <laughs> I don't even care. All right, question number six: Did Coach Henny get? Did the Coach Henny hype get too big, too fast? Eric McKinney. Uh, Coach Henny has hold on. I wrote this in my notes somewhere. He has coached. Uh, he has coached zero zero games. He's coached zero games at USC. He came in to develop players and put a good defensive line together. Improve the guys that he has. Not gonna know. Not gonna know. I we can tell if they show up against LSU and they are playing seven yards downfield pushed back into the safeties yeah that's a problem that's a problem for now when we have no sense of what that line's going to look like and what they're going to be able to accomplish no the idea of having all recruit no coach coaches i'm done with that i'm done with that if we wanted what turned out to be like five dante williams all over the defensive staff you could have gone and done that if he's going to be the opposite of that, which is he's not the opposite of that. We've talked about that, that 2025 class that he started to put together there. If he if he goes out and they play good, solid football along the defensive line, that's where you're going to get your answer. We just don't it's not it's not here yet. There's no answer to that yet. So McKinney refuses to answer the question, even though he started. No, off so I like no no my answer is no because so you can't mckinney's yeah. answer is no the hype didn't get too big too fast even though he's coached zero games and we don't know what to make of it uh mark colkin go ahead and answer the question i i, I have a feeling you're going to do better than that go ahead what is it is, yes the hype got out there over the prep because of what eric just said we don't know what he's capable of doing coaching at this level right now we know he's capable of coaching up an Aaron Donald. We know he's capable of coaching up uh, with Kobe Turner at, with the Rams as well. We have an idea. We, we think he's going to be pretty good. But right now, it's all hype over prep. 
and we know what happened. USC is known for this. This happens all the time. Oh, yes, so well, we're off to a really good start with the 2025 recruiting class. However, we were all expecting the 2024 spring transfer portal window to be Eric Henderson party all the time. That hasn't happened. Sorry. The hype has gone nationwide, just not into the transfer portal. Mark Holkin says, Coach Henney, all hype. He's all sizzle, no steak. Uh, listen, I'm going to give I'm going to give Culkin the point, not so much because I thought that was a great answer, although it was fine, because I feel a little guilty about taking one away from them the last time. It's now four to two. Uh, if right, LSU don't, don't runs for 12 like yards, if yeah. LSU runs for 12 yards, will you come back in the comments of this video and update update the points? Uh, I don't even know I if will. I know how to do that, but um, but yes. I, I, if because at that point, the hype, the hype will be exactly on pace for what we said he was going to do when he got to USC. Eric, how much money are you getting on that happening? The 12 What's yards. that? 12 yards rushing. How much are you getting on that happening? 12 yards. How many plays do I get? 12 yards rushing. <laughs> you get, you get the full game. No, I think I still think he's going to develop a good defensive line, and every single player that plays for him will get noticeably better. I agree with you. Yeah, I think that's probably true, too. It's still 4-2, just because. Question number seven. Favorite war movie? Mark Hogan, go. Sergeant York. Um, very, I don't know why. It's not a, it's not a huge, it's not a, not a lot of fighting action, but the story that it told and the ending. To me, I just, he got what he wanted to, by doing some hard work. What mattered to him the most was family and home. He didn't want to fight in the war. He did it, and he was able to find ways to do it without, you know, going outside of his. I don't know what's the way, right, right, right way of putting it. Outside of what he believed in, he did it because it was the right thing to do. And in the end, he was rewarded for doing the right thing. Faith, family, fighting. That's what that movie was all Faith, about. Family, fight, yes. All right, Eric McKinney, what do you got? I know there's times where you ask for one thing and I only give you one answer and you go, no, I wish that you had given me a list of five and knocked them out one at a time. Never happened. So I'm going to, I'm going to do that again. Uh, <laughs> so here's top three and I'll give you one Jojo rabbit. I loved and glorious bastards. I loved my favorite one, three Kings. Okay. I'm not sure what to make of, uh, of either answer. I'll be honest with you. Um, Inglourious Bastards is one of my favorite movies. That's fantastic. But that wasn't your answer. And and I haven't seen Sergeant York. Maybe it's amazing. I'll probably go watch it now. But I've never seen it. But but it sounds like it sounds like it it's some sort of combination of Clay Helton and then the uh, and then the the guy that saved everybody in the in the Pacific, even though he didn't want to hold a gun. What what's what's the, what's that movie? You remember this? He said, like, I feel like that's, I feel like that was just a remake of Mark's movie. I think it's the same thing. It might have been. Go okay. Mark. Gary Cooper. Right. I'm going to give the point to Mark Culkin because he gave me a movie recommendation that may turn out to be good. But if I watch the movie and don't like it, I'm going to take that point back later. It's four to three, and we're going. Question number eight. This is the important question, I think. And I, I think that the team that, the team that I would like to answer probably can't be the right answer because they use every color. But question number eight is, what are the ugliest school colors of any major college? Colkin. Well, Oregon. The, which, which color? I mean... Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. All matter. Just all of them? All See, of them. that feels... That feels like you're trying too hard to curry favor with me. Eric McKinney, what is uh, what is your answer? I mean, to help Mark, right, it's an inclusive set. So if Oregon uses all the colors, then technically the ugliest colors are comprised within that set. And uh, the most beautiful. Both, uh, right. So then he runs into trouble, right? He's got to defend yeah. himself for saying Oregon has the best uniforms now, which you can go back to him when I'm done. Bowl, Bowling Green, for me, I know it's like the Browns-ish, but like – Brown and brown orange is is not not no you can't you just can't do anything with that. Yeah, that's pretty grim. 
I mean, even brown and yellow like Wyoming, it's bad. But their white uniforms look great. I've never seen a bowling green uniform that that I would put on anybody. I, I don't know about that Texas burnt orange either. It, it, that's, I mean, you know, um, what's his name? The Boz famously described it as puke colored. It is, it is a questionable, it's a questionable color. And they didn't even choose a second color. They were so excited about the first one. They just, just that. Okay, well, like, what are your colors? Well, just burnt orange. Okay, but like, is there another one? No, just burnt orange. That's weird. And when they wore like the mesh, like practice style jersey look too, uh, I mean, yes, yeah. not good. It's not, it's not, not good. good. Mark, you, you look confused. What, what is it that uh, is weighing on your mind right now? Not a darn thing. Okay. I didn't know breakaway jerseys that mesh were, were part of the thing, but okay. Oh, you think he's straight outside the question? <laughs> uh, my answer was Bowling Green. Chris is talking about Texas. That's true. That's true. Okay, so I lose another point. I'm down to negative two. Um, and I'm going to give Mark a point. Even though his answer was questionable because they use every single color, just because it was anti-Oregon. I accused him of trying to curry favor with me, and it worked. We're tied at four. Question number nine. This comes from a viewer on the WeRSC message board. The question is, did Lando Calrissian throw Han Solo under the bus and the Empire strikes back? Eric McKinney, did he? I probably. Look, I so I can tell you, if you show me a scene of Star Wars, I can say that is from <laughs> Star Wars. I cannot tell you what movie it's from or what was sort of happening. Look, I know I could feel your disappointment, Chris, through the screen. Yeah, right. Because wasn't like didn't Darth Vader get him at that point? Like that feels mean. It feels just mean. Stop. Like just stop talking to do that, Eric. You what you're saying is that you have no idea, and the more you talk, the worse. That's all it I got, is. Culkin. What do you think? Um, the answer is yes. But wasn't oh, that sounds, that sounds a lot like my answer, Chris. It did sound yeah, like I didn't try and sell it, Eric. You started your answer by saying, I've never seen Star Wars. I can't name any of the characters, but I'm going to say yes. And that's a lame answer. Uh, but Mark, was it justified? He was trying to save his city. I mean. I, I guess if you're looking at it from, you know, does more people count versus the one? But I don't know if, if the, the people that, the, the city that Lando was in charge of mattered as much in the, in the bigger picture, as much as Han Solo. Okay. So Mark Culkin thinks he should have killed all of his own people. Well, they um, did make a movie, right? Mark's right. They made a standalone movie about Han Solo. They did not make a standalone movie about whatever city that guy ran. I bet there, uh, there'll probably be a standalone Lando Calrissian, a st uh, standalone Lando Calrissian movie at some point. I would suspect. Got to. There's still if there's a character in a major yeah. uh, movie, you got to make a standalone movie about him. Okay, I can't remember which of our premium subscribers uh, threw in that question. Whoever it is, I'm sure is like really really disappointed in the effort the two of you put into answering. We should do a Star Wars question every week. We're going I would, to I'd be excited about that. We're going to until you've actually watched one of the movies. It's four to four. It's four to four. I'm not going to give anybody a point. Look, we just I, I like to I like to bring in the premium subscribers, let them ask a question, and then you guys do that. Four to four. Question number. I'm going to start feeding them questions. This is yeah, that makes sense. I'm All right. Just stuck with the original question. Are you talking to me? I should have stuck with the original question. Should we just All start right. with question number nine? It's now four to three, McKinney. Question number I, 10. I, I, you're not putting that I on. I appreciate you specifying that I was still up because you may have taken away a point from anybody at that point. When your head goes down, there's no telling what's coming back up. Yeah. I don't know how, I don't know how in a Star Wars question, by the way, which was put on the message board like five or six days ago, that, that McKinney knows is probably going to come up and then... He admits he's never watched a Star Wars movie, and it was an embarrassing answer, but somehow he comes out one point ahead in the exchange. That's why people accuse me of being dishonest in my duties, but they're wrong. Question number 10. All right, for those viewers who have never attended a USC home game, maybe we're talking to Big Ten fans at this point, give them the ideal weekend itinerary, but you're doing it in less than a minute. You don't have forever. 
where they where should they go? What should they see the weekend they first go to a USC football game? Mark Hulkin, go. Uh, well, first place they should go, um, USC campus. Get there Friday night. Check out the rally. Get involved in that. Ask around where you want to go to have dinner. There's plenty of places to eat around LA, around the USC campus, down the street, down Figueroa. On Saturday, get there early. Set up. Your, if you don't have your own tailgate, find a tailgate. Make sure there's plenty of seats. Make sure there's TV set up. Make sure there's food. Bring a six-pack or a 12-pack. Make sure you're bringing something. And then as we get closer to the game, you're going to head down McClintock. In fact, follow the band as they march towards the Coliseum. And then after the game, watch USC beat Ohio State or Michigan or whomever is coming from the Big Ten Conference. And then after the game, this is really important. This is how you finish the game off. You're going to hear a bunch of people outside yelling, hot dog, hot dog, hot dog. Go get one of those. It's called a victory dog. It's not good for you. They smell great. They taste great. But that's how you finish off the perfect weekend, as well as with a glass of champagne because UCLA and Notre Dame also lost that weekend. And these days, you can get one of those hot dogs without the LAPD chasing the people away. Yeah. Yes. It, you, a few years ago, the LAP and I asked one of the I asked one of the uh, LAPD guys. I said, "Why are you doing this?" Because it seems to me that what you're doing is is making it far more likely that people are going to get trampled in this crowd. And and he said, "Well, I mean, you know that they don't follow the health uh, the the health inspector uh, uh, and, and those and those health code rules when they make these hot dogs." And I said. You're telling me that the people who are selling the hot dogs outside of the stadium, out of a shopping cart, weren't inspected by the health code? But these days they don't chase them down. They don't. They don't beat them with batons. So it's 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 safe to get. Uh, Eric McKinney, improve upon Mark Hulkin's answer. What should these What should these Nebraska fans do if this is their first USC game this year? So I'm going to borrow a bit of it. I think you stay, I think you stay downtown. If you can stay at the JW Marriott somewhere around LA live and you, I'm going to do Mark one better. Get in on Thursday, take all day Friday, go down to the beach, Manhattan beach, walk around down there. I don't know if they have maps of where all like the athletes live, but all the professional sports players are, are down there. Uh, if you want to do like the strand house or the kettle, something like that, Something where you eat with a with a beach view. Saturday morning, first thing to the pantry and then straight to campus. I like the Science Center. The Endeavor is is something that's like a cool checkout before. Uh, it's free to get into the Science Center. Endeavor is, I don't know, a couple bucks to see that. Uh, I'm with Mark. Check out a, a tailgate. Although if anyone's going to talk about tailgating, it's Mark, who's got, got lots of thoughts to say about how, how bad it's gotten there. Uh, Sunday morning, if you're a Runyon Canyon person or a Malibu beach person, get out to one of those two things. And then on your way back, a quick $20 million donation to House of Victory. And that'll wrap things up for you. That's strong. But what is your position on hot dog, hot dog? Oh, yeah. So included in that. And when I said I skipped, right, when you go to the pantry and you go straight to campus, Heritage Hall has got to be one. You got to see the the Heisman trophies and all of that stuff too. It, it's, it'll be, I'm fascinated to see when that new facility comes in, if there's a bunch of display cases and all of that for USC stuff. But right now that kind of central lobby at Heritage, Heritage Hall for sure is, is a must visit for anyone coming in. All right, Colgan, anything to add? Oh, congratulations, Eric. Good game. He conceded. This is good because I actually wasn't sure who was going to win this game, but Culkin uh, conceded the match. And by the way, it don't don't leave nasty messages about how I cheated, Mark. You saw once again he conceded the game. Thank you for your sportsmanship, Mark. I appreciate it, uh, Eric. Congratulations on another really fantastic <laughs> victory. I am. I mean, I am. You have no idea how terrified I am of the Star Wars mob coming after this. Like, I this this was not something that needed to be made public. Yeah, I mean, currently you are the Tom Brady of the of the Arlegis Ten Questions game, but you're right. There are people out there that think less of you now, uh, and yeah. and some of those people probably didn't think a lot of you to begin with. Okay, I guess we're done, fellas. Good show. Well, I guess we'll see. We'll see what people say. Maybe it's a good show. Whether it's a good show or not, it's over. We'll see you all next week. Until then, fight on, everybody. <laughs>